Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to this event with Dr. Alessio Fasano and Susie Flaherty discussing their new co-authored book, Gut Feelings, The Microbiome and Our Health. This lecture is part of our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now beyond. We have an amazing May lineup of Science Book Talks coming up, featuring Kate Darling, David Eagleman, and Carlo Ravelli, and more. To learn more about the series, you can visit the webpage harvard.com science or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. We also have a YouTube page where you can view previous talks that you might have missed, um, and I will be posting links in the Zoom chat in just a few minutes. The evening's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would, th this afternoon's event, there we go, will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speaker something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows. Um, I would also like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage during these strange virtual times. Your support makes this author series possible and ensures the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for authors, indie book selling, and especially for science. Um, and finally, as you might have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. So if they do, I'm gonna do my best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I am honored to introduce our speakers. World-renowned pediatric gastroenterologist, Dr. Alessio Fasano is the founder and director of the Center for Celiac Research and Treatment at Massachusetts General Hospital. I would also like to say the center is very near and dear to my heart because I was actually treated there for celiac myself. Dr. Fasano is also the W. Allen Walker Chair of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition at MGH, Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and Professor of Nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We're also joined tonight by award-winning science writer and editor, Susie Flaherty, who's Director of Communications at the Center for Celiac Research and Treatment. Together, our authors also co-wrote the book, Gluten Freedom, the nation's leading expert offers the essential guide to a healthy gluten-free lifestyle. They'll be discussing their new co-authored book, Gut Feelings, which transforms our understanding of the microbiome to be a rich ecosystem of microorganisms that we need to understand, respect, and engage with. Of the book, best-selling author Mark Hyman writes, the microbiome revolution proves the old adage that you are what you eat. Fasano and Flaherty provide a comprehensive and compelling portrait of the bugs that shape us from early childhood through old age and their role in human health. We are so pleased to host them for this conversation this afternoon. So without further ado, Dr. Fasano and Ms. Flaherty, the digital podium is yours. Thank you, Kate, for the nice in in introduction. And uh, uh, thank you for joining this um, presentation, our book today. Uh, Susie and I um, are very, uh, you know, um, eager to uh, just uh, present very briefly um, what has been uh, a, a quite a, an enterprise as a project. Um, the, the, the topic is uh, challenging but stimulating at the same time. And also we are on the verge of a revolution of, uh, uh, you know, human health. And as you will um, appreciate in the next few minutes, the microbiome uh, really um, plays a, a, a huge role in deciding if we stay healthy or if we develop disease. And the more we learn how we should really engage in a friendly symbiotic relationship with the microbiome, the more likely we can take our you know, health in our hands because uh, again, this new knowledge that we try to encapsulate in this book will give us a path um, how to live longer and healthier lives. Um, again, uh, Susie and I, uh, you know, when we were invited uh, to write this book, uh, Susie backed me up here. We didn't uh, appreciate what we're assigning for. <laughs> uh, 
it, it was much more challenging than we expected. Um, but uh, we believe that the final product, um, it, it is very stimulating, at least in our opinion. Also because as Susie will tell you in a moment, uh, we relied on who is who in the world of microbiome to have some contribution to expand and deepen uh, what is the content on this book. Why we do that? Why we really engage in this enterprise? Uh, mainly because uh, for us that have been in the, in the domain of, of human health for quite a while, it's been pretty obvious that there's been some changes literally uh, that change what were the science paradigms in terms of why people they stay healthy, why, you know, at a certain point in their life, they lose their luxury and develop diseases. And probably the most influential aspects of, you know, the rational to write, you, uh, you know, gut feelings really stem for the observation that was put out there a while ago on the fact that you know, we are in the midst of, uh, you know, an epidemics in the Western hemisphere of a variety of chronic inflammatory diseases. Just to put this in perspective, for the two million years of evolution, uh, the, the main reason why humankind got sick and died were infections. Uh, and, and that was true until the recent past. Uh, so um, when we start to really get more insights of infectious diseases and, and science and, and fields like, you know, bacteria pathogenesis, microbiology start to take really, um, you know, more a solid ground, we really had a better understanding how we got infected and what we could do about it to mitigate these infections. And start from the early 60s, the, uh, you know, the rate of, of these infections that really affected tremendously the humankind uh, really plummeted uh, based on the advent of antibiotics, hygiene, uh, you know, implementation hygiene, you know, guidelines, um, vaccines, and so on and so forth. So, Infections like rheumatic fever, ep, hay, mumps, measles, to be, uh, you know, just plummeted. However, this was a phenomenon that was mainly on, uh, you know, uh, observed in the, again, the industrialized countries uh, and during exactly the same timeline. It was observed that there was a similar steeping curve, but going in the wrong direction upward of non-infective chronic inflammatory diseases like Crohn's disease and multiple sclerosis, type one diabetes, asthma, and so on and so forth. Bottom line, while, you know, in the southern hemispheres of developing countries, people there continue to die of infectious diseases. Um, in the industrialized countries, we didn't die fast of infectious diseases anymore, but we die very slowly of these chronic inflammatory diseases. And, and this is, you know, again, something that we see on and on and on, an example of this chronic in, in, inflammatory diseases in the Western hemispheres, in which, for example, autoimmune diseases like celiac disease doubled every 15 years. Uh, food allergies that were not known in China, there's a, a sort of a, a, a natural experiment in an environment that only in 10 years moved from a rural development lifestyle to a highly industrialized uh, lifestyle. In those 10 years, they cut up with the industrialized countries in terms of you know, the epidemics of this condition like food allergies and so on and so forth. And inflammatory bowel disease, the same story. We see this also in cancer. Uh, cancer, of course, has the connotation of inflammation, and therefore we see the same steep increase of cancer. But probably the most remarkable example of these epidemics is represented by uh, the phenomenon of autism. Uh, you know, in, in only a quarter century, we moved from one in 5,000 kids with autism in one in 58 and growing. Uh, and with a, a male-female ratio of four to one, that means, means the next generation 
one child out of four, one boy out of four will be lost for autism. So this is really tremendously impactful and, and worrisome. At this point, you know, based on this observation, you can conclude, you know, that if you are a pessimistic individual and you see uh, the glass half, you know, empty, you will conclude that uh, eventually we are ch changing the environment too fast for us to adapt and we pay a dear price. Of course, you know, 40, 50 years, you can't blame genetics to be responsible for this epidemic. So the other flip of the coin that has been a traditionally thought to be necessary, sufficient to develop diseases, I, environmental factors, those are the ones that then needs to be blamed. And that's the reason why all this was called the hygiene hypothesis. We're too clean for our goods. Yes, we're not got infections, but we eventually make ourselves susceptible to these conditions. The same phenomenon can be read in a totally different way if you have a more optimistic point of view. In the past, when uh, we embarked for the Human Genome Project, we did so because we were absolutely convinced that the genes dictate our destiny. And if you're born with the genes to develop multiple sclerosis, serious disease, breast cancer, Alzheimer, you name it, there was nothing you can do about it. So sooner or later, because you are genetically predisposed, you will develop the problem. This phenomenon we just saw here is telling us otherwise. It's telling us that if we play our genetic cards in a wrong way, we will lose the game. That's the reason why in such a short period of time, we have seen this increase of, of these conditions. However, if we understand what we've been doing wrong, and therefore we try to remediate and mitigate the mistakes made, we will eventually potentially have the capability to slow down, if not even reverse this trend. In other words, what I'm saying is having the genes for these conditions may be necessary, but definitely not sufficient. If we do or do not develop this condition, it depends on our lifestyle. So based on this observation, based on this epidemiological you know, evidence, many of us that work on this kind of conditions develop an alternative hypothesis of why you eventually on a specific genetic background develop problems. Of course, the genetic is important as important are environmental factors. So they remain absolutely necessary, but not sufficient. There are at least another three elements at play that seems to be important uh, to develop this condition. The third one is an increase uh, permeability of this barrier that segregates us as human beings from the environment, allowing these environmental triggers to come in our body. The gut being the large interface, and that's the reason why it's listed as you know, one element. So that you know, environmental factor that typically are kept at bay outside our body have access and will interact with our genes. Uh, the fourth is, of course, because we're talking about chronic inflammation, an immune system that becomes hyperbelligerent. So in other words, you know, turn on this inflammation, it's not capable to really modulate and control the level of inflammation. And last, not the least, an object of this uh, book that Susie and I just uh, uh, published, the microbiome. So this ecosystem, this complex ecosystem of microorganisms for with which since the dawn of our you know, evolution two million years ago, we've been co-evolved with and negotiate with and try to find a friendly interaction so that we can eventually stay in a study of health. Even if you know, we present this as a technically five distant pillars, they are highly, highly interconnected. They influence each other. But most importantly, the microbiome is capable eventually to influence if, why, and when our genes will be put in motion so that you switch from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. So in other words, what I just explained is the concept of epigenetics. And if I can try to really make this even more clear, 
contrary to what believe, we believed before that we were genetically speaking made by our human genome that will dictate all the elements to stay healthy or develop disease. When we completed that and we realized that the human genome is rather rudimental, only 23,000 genes, that's all. The old paradigm, one gene, one protein, one disease went out of the window. And question being how we can be so complex as a, a, a species, but at the same time, how it's so, you know, intermingled interactions with the environment may translate and stay healthy or develop disease, how this can be explained on a such simple genetic basis? Well, the answer is that only one flip of the coin. The human genome is, of course, is extremely important, is stable, is of course inherited from our, both our parents. And in terms of composition, it doesn't change, it's, it's to stay there. But again, as I said before, the fact that we have the genes for any given disease, it doesn't mean that this disease will materialize clinically. If it does, it does not depend on us, this other genome, the microbiome, that if we're lucky, we'll inherit it from our mothers, means that it's more friendly with us, but it's extremely dynamic. Change from individual to individual and the same individual all the time. So if I can <clears throat> even bring this to the next level of, you know, um, you know, basic concept, even if a little bit repetitive as a concept, imagine the human genome as a sort of piano with 23, uh, you know, notes, one uh, for each gene. Now let's say that the, uh, play the, uh, the song celiac disease or Alzheimer or breast cancer, you have to strike 300 these notes so that you play the tune uh, of these conditions. It really depends on the piano player. And the piano player is the microbiome. It is extremely dynamic. So let's say that Elton John will sit at the piano, strike 200 these 300 notes because he's playing, you know, pop music. You're not going to play the song City Disease. Then something happened to you. You got an infection, so you have a stress, you've been traveling, uh, you know, whatever. Now it's Chopin sitting at the piano. He's a virtuoso. He can touch all 300 notes. And now you switch from genetic predisposition to clinical outcome. So that brings us to the reason why Susie and I wrote this book. At the beginning, we knew very little. You know, I've been studying this, uh, you know, since the beginning of my professional career, but I had no idea what I was looking at since I was very focused on pathogens. And that's what we all believe that the microbiome in general, microorganisms were all about, you know, folks there trying to really harm us. But now we know that it's much more complex. That's really essential for our health for many, many reasons. The number of, you know, microorganisms, when I say microorganisms, I mean bacteria, viruses, archaea, parasites, and so on and so forth. It's enormous. The number, again, is changing, but at least, at least it's the same number, if not more, of the, our own cells. One thing that they never change is that, you know, put them together, this ecosystem generate 150 times more genome that's our own. And if we really negotiate for a friendly relationship, there is a mutual benefit to stay together. Uh, what we got out of this relationship, microbiome, if it's balanced with our you know, metabolic needs, will generate energy from, for us, energy from food that we cannot make use because we can't digest like fibers help to regulate our metabolism with some key function of metabolism. And that's the essence of what the microbiome is really, it's all about when it comes to health. Um, produce, you know, vitamins that are, otherwise we can't get from the diet. Uh, regulate the immune system to make sure that, you know, will be defensive and not aggressive against us. And of course, protect us against pathogens. After all, what is penicillin, penicillin if not a substance produced by a bacterium to kill another bacteria. So that's the reason why there's been a, such a huge interest in terms of the microbiome composition and function. However, there is one concept that, you know, we have to be very, very clear because of course now there's this frenzy to go after the microbiome to try to modulate it uh, for own good. There is a symbiotic relationship that is very, very personal. 
So there is no such a thing as, quote, unquote, the normal microbiome. It depends who we are genetically, because we need to find that symbiotic friendly relationship that is unique, not reproducible from one individual to another. Again, evolution is telling us that that's the case. And that's the reason why the first part of the uh, book is um, all you know, focused on the wisdom of macroscopic species and how we can co-evolved uh, from uh, uh, the species standpoint of view with the microbiome and what really uh, has been, you know, this journey during evolution that we took, you know, with uh, this, you know, uh, parallel species, if, 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 if a parallel, you know, uh, universe, universe, if you allow me that, that is the microbiome. Of course, you know, there's a lot of discussion and, and you know, Susie would expand a little bit more about when we start the engraftment. Is that a birth when we are delivered? It can even start in utero. Uh, and if that's the case, you know, how environmental factor impinging on mom can already affect the march of the engraftment and therefore friendly relationship. And, you know, what happened to us in terms of, uh, you know, uh, nutrients and, and, and diet? and lifestyle as a older. So in other words, there is this crucial period of time, what we call the first thousand days from conception to two years of age, in which everything is focused to find that friendly relationship. Anything that derailed us from what was the plan of evolution in to find each other so that we can live in a friendly relationship will have consequences tremendous consequences in terms of how we play again our genetic cards. The, the second part is all focused on, you know, what can go wrong if this friendly relationship is not established and now we have a belligerent microbiome or imbalanced microbiome, we'll call dysbiosis. And, you know, and what is the role in diseases? I hear they are not even a close, complete list of conditions that have been published that link a imbalanced microbiome to this, you know, chronic inflammatory diseases. The third and probably most um, forthcoming part of the book, uh, because again, we are really working while, you know, science pour in, in real time. And, and you know, one of the other challenges that we had is that by the time that we wrote the chapter and move to the next one, a thousand paper come out. So that chapter became obsolete. So we have to start all over again because this is extremely dynamic. But probably the most dynamic part is how we can really manipulate the microbiome to our own, you know, um, goods and, and to have a good return on investment. Of all the elements out there, probably the environmental factor that is more impactful on the microbiome composition and function is definitely nutrients, it's definitely our diets. Uh, you know, we are born only once. So, uh, you know, if, you know, the C-section is detrimental for us. That's a point there. Uh, you know, pollutions, you may man be exposed, you know, on a regular basis and antibiotics, you can take, you know, some antibiotics here and there. And this is all to mention, you know, stuff that can really affect in a negative way, the, the composition and function of microbiome, but we eat three, four times a day and the microorganism, they eat whatever we eat. So a, a, an inappropriate diet is definitely the most impactful you know, environmental factor that can really turn you know, the microbiome against us. Just a paper that was published a couple of years ago has been an open eye for a variety of us that are interested in nutrition that by age standardized mortality, um, it, this was a study done worldwide. The, the most frequent reason why we die nowadays is related to nutrition. The darker, the more red is the uh, area, the more the nutrition inappropriate you know, imp implementation is impactful in terms of morbidity and mortality. And if you look at you know, what are the, 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 the key elements of the diet that can put at risk to become sick and therefore die, you see there a list of elements, even the first one, high sodium, 
made, made an argument that together with low in grains, low in fruits, low in nuts and seeds, low in vegetables, uh, omega-3 fiber, it's on its work, all of them, they impinge on the microbiome. Any of those elements of the diet that is missing, it will have a really negative impact on the microbiome. And if you want to really focus on that, you know, square, I mean, uh, that uh, rectangle that I just put out there, these elements of the diet, not only they really affect the microbiome, but they also are socioeconomically imbalanced. So in other words, people, they're in a low socioeconomic, you know, scale because can't afford to eat well are the ones that they have deficiency of these elements and therefore increase their risk to develop chronic inflammatory diseases. You know, uh, obesity probably is a, a classical example that you know, uh, decades and decades ago was the disease of the wealth, now is the disease of the poor people. So these are the key elements, by the way, they are provided by the Mediterranean diet that has been now studied at, you know, in a scientific way as a key element of, you know, has shaped the microbiome in a correct way. We cannot finish without touching on, you know, the uh, ongoing COVID-19 pandemics. Again, we were in the midst of wrapping up this book when COVID-19 hits worldwide. So Susie and I had to go back and rewrite some of this chapter to take in consideration where we were learning learning fast uh, on, on the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's now, I believe, pretty solidly shown that the COVID-19 infection can really have a, a, an impact to the microbiome and the dye-shaped microbiome can influence the susceptibility. You know, unfortunately, this is a, 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 a very painful it's like to show, I mean, you know, this is something that we, this generation had never been experienced before in terms of impact on morbidity, almost 160 million cases worldwide, 3.3 million death. Uh, you know, it, it, it is mind blowing what we've been going through and, and it's hopefully we're at the tail of it, but you know, let's hope that it is in this case. In the United States, 32 million cases and 581,000 deaths. It's it's enormous toll that we pay for these pandemics. And who are the people that succumbed? Who are, who are the people that they are at risk to get this infection? People who are obese, with metabolic disorder, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, other preconditions, air the least. Common denominator, nutrients, diet. That it's not putting us in a way that can be ready to fight such a, a nasty virus. So, you know, the Mediterranean diet, again, it seems to be uh, now the best way that we can shape the uh, microbiome to our favor. But, you know, as all the, you know, the, you know, diet pyramids on the bottom, there is stuff that we eat the most and the top of the one eat the less. In the Mediterranean diet at the bottom, there is no food. There is lifestyle. You know, we don't grow old anymore together. We don't eat together, um, you know, on a regular basis. We don't exercise the way that we used to. Um, and honestly, we also do, you know, we, we live a stressful life. You know, just think about the last year, you know, with social isolation and so on and so forth. So th there is a lot to say that all this, even, you know, on, on a surface seems to not be related to the microbiome as great deal to, uh, you know, um, uh, affect the microbiome in its composition and function because it's not just diet, of course, it's lifestyle. I'm gonna finish by saying that, you know, that thousand days of life that is again in that box, it really will create the trajectory of what's gonna happen to us in adult life. We cannot manipulate our genes. We can manipulate the way that our genes are put in motion by really taking good care of our microbiome. We were flying blind until the recent past, but you know, gut feelings um, with uh, some strong insights that we were able to put together 
in what I believe is now a comprehensive you know, overview of the matter, is giving us a path, is giving us a direction, what we should do eventually to try to play our genetic arts the best way possible. If we do so, of course, we put uh, down the foundation to live longer and healthier life. If we do not, what's going to happen is, again, fast risk factors with obesity, metabolic syndromes, type 2 diabetes, and so on and so forth, will be impinged in the wrong way. And even the way that we age, there, there, are, you know, there are people that age graciously and people that you know, age fast and with the severe, severe preconditions and comorbidities will depend on our microbiome and how we will play our cards. And again, diet is one of the things that we can do eventually to uh, stay healthy and, and maintain that state of health. That is, you know, the part that I want to cover, but, you know, I also want to, uh, you know, uh, be mindful and, and, and again, uh, be uh, honest that, you know, this was a tremendous work of collaborative efforts that, uh, you know, uh, impinged only also on uh, a variety of colleagues of ours that we eventually contact to have their word of wisdom. And I would like to pass the baton to Susie to share with you how practically this book was born. <laughs> that was a long, you know, labor <laughs> intense, you know, process. But, you know, again, who better than Susie can give you these details because she was the engineer orchestrator to put these pieces of the puzzle together. Yes, uh, thank you, Alessio. That, um, I consider my, another label I put on myself is midwife, which is um, also I think appropriate for the, for the work that went into this book. And thank you, you've shared a lot of science, which is, is really wonderful. And, but we remember, it reminds me that science is a very human endeavor. And some might say it's, it's some of the highest work that we do as humans on this planet, um, but it is a human endeavor. And if you'll permit me an analogy, um, one of the themes of this book is that, that as we look at the microbiome and the loss of diversity in our, our gut microbiome, and there's, there's a lot of that, particularly in the first part of the book about the ancestral microbiome and how, um, how that affects com comparative, we talk, look at the Hasda in Africa and different different ancestral microbiomes and the diversity that they have is quite different and even a what's considered a malign microbe brevitella in our society is different in theirs so it's such it's so complex and it's so diverse just as diversity is a strength in almost all natural systems we found that diversity would be a strength in writing this book and i can remember when our executive editor, Bob Pryor from MIT Press, who is one of the most patient men in the world, I would say, came to us and said, we would like you to write a book on the microbiome. And this is six years ago, probably, it was a while ago. And, um, and Alessio said, well, I can remember walking across the, the Constitution parking lot, you know, where the boat, and Alessio was like, well, we could do this one of two ways. We could write a fairly narrow book with my knowledge about the microbiome and, you know, you can, we can work on the research and, or we could reach out to collaborators and experts in obesity and cancer and autoimmunity and neurobiology. And so that's what we decided to do. And that meant, um, it meant more work, but it meant a much richer and deeper experience for both of us in writing this book and also for the reader, we hope. So that was a wonderful piece um, for me, working with all these, and we have 15 collaborators. They're listed in the acknowledgments at the end and you can see who they are. But um, some of them we work with at MGH, but they're all over the world as well. So that was a wonderful piece for me. And one of them was uh, Forrest Rower. And I was lucky enough to do a lot of work on the, the other ohms. Because the focus of the book, a lot of it is on bacteria, which has been the overwhelming focus in the science as well. That's changing. And I did some research into hantavirus um, because it was just this 
this amazing and horrifying story of how this Hantra virus took the lives of young people in Arizona in, um, gosh, it was the 80s, in the Four Corners area of uh, the Southwest United States. And they they just couldn't figure out what, where, why this virus that just basic respiratory virus that killed these people very suddenly, young, healthy people. And so I did a whole piece on that and learned about forest rower brought beautiful information into that chapter. And lo and behold, a COVID hit, as Alessio says, and we, we, we were reminded anew that the power of a tiny microbe is so much greater than our ability to fight it sometimes. And that really made us, re we, re we revised some of the book, we, we did some work on COVID. And I'd just like to read you a little piece about COVID. Um, we completed writing this book before a novel coronavirus initiated a global pandemic, severely testing the international public health response and world economies. We have added some material on COVID to certain sections, but we recognize that the public health and research landscape will change rapidly in the coming year. Our best hope is that a highly collaborative and rapid response from the international research community, aided by industry and supported by thoughtful world leaders will continue to develop effective treatments and vaccine candidates by the time of this book's publication and beyond. You will have your own opinion as to whether that, that hope has come true. It certainly has to some extent, but the other piece that COVID has taught us about the microbiome in the world is that science is truly an evolving, an evolving um, enterprise and collaborating and working together is the only way that we will be able to solve these issues. One tiny piece I'll finish with, if you noticed in Alessio's slides, he had a picture of Leonardo da Vinci, one of his sketches. And this to me kind of sums up the whole notion of the microbiome because the the, the sketches, I read, uh, there's some recent research, seven sketches of Leonardo da Vinci have now been subjected to the third generation of sequencing, which is the nanopore, which is now the latest and deeper dive into the microbiome. And they've done this to the sketches of Leonardo da Vinci, so they'll, they will be better able to conserve them. And they found all kinds of stuff on there, you know, insect seeds and human DNA and fingerprints and lots of stuff. But the study of the microbiome is so essential to our survival as well as our health. So that's the thought I would like to leave you with today. Thank you for listening. All right, so thank you, Hi. Susie. Kate, I don't know if uh, you want us to go through the questions or you want to uh, moderate those. Uh, um. Yes, I'm happy to moderate um, questions right now. We've had some come in and just a reminder that people can add questions whenever they would like to throughout, throughout this section. Um, let's see, I'd like to start with a question by Yan Ting who asks, what is the age distribution of the autoimmune diseases for the developed country compared to the infectious diseases for the developing country? Wondering if there is a correlation to older age as well. Of course, you know, if you grow old, the chance to develop autoimmune diseases is much, much higher. And therefore, you know, there can be just that the reason why we see that differences, but there are autoimmune diseases like, uh, for example, um, you know, see the disease is one example that is, it's, it's in general, uh, not always in type 1 diabetes, uh, you know, diseases that materialize very, very early in age. So in other words, uh, you know, in the past, you know, diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes were, was called juvenile diabetes because you develop the first 10 years of life. Same was for C disease. And we're not seeing uh, you know, the same uh, incidents in developing countries and in industrialized countries. So there is definitely something that has to do with lifestyle other than, you know, the, the age distribution. Um, of course, you know, uh, the, the, the longer you live, the more there is a chance that you develop chronic inflammatory disease. So you can, an argument can be made that, you know, if you're succumbing to infectious diseases because 
your average age of survival is 40 years, while in, in developing countries, 80. In industrialized countries, that can be part of, of the difference. But once again, I believe there is much more than that. Uh, we also have an anonymous attendee asks, could you speak about the role of machine learning in the microbiome? So, so you want to answer ask that because we have a huge part of the book that's dedicated to that. Perfect. Yes, we've got chapter 17, which is uh, titled Artificial Intelligence, Synthetic Biology and the Microbiome. And we worked with uh, Dr. Tim Liu, who's at MIT, at, to, and also one of our colleagues, Dr. Zoma Rodi, which uh, to talk about how developing, uh, and actually we have a study underway, which is called CDGEM, which Kate might relate to because um, having been familiar with the celiac center, celiac CDGEM is the celiac disease genetic and environmental and metabolome microbiome study. And our colleague, Ali Zomarodi is a collaborator, collaborator on that, that study we have collected over 500 biological samples, which means poop and blood from babies and their moms and different pieces and then an enormous amount of environmental data uh, demographics. And Ali Zomarati has is putting that into his um, into his magic machine, I call it. Alessio can give you the, the details, but he's coming up with uh, uh, what pulling out what could be a celiac disease phenotype based on his machine learning tools. So that's a very exciting piece in we talk about in the book. And then Tim Liu is in synthetic biology and creating synthetic genomes to better understand the microbiome. Fill me in there, Alessio, if I've missed something. Yeah, no, no, you, you cover this just okay. uh, correctly. But yeah. bottom line, this is the future. This is the way that we're going to do personalized medicine and we will prevent disease because it's this modeling that will give us why on a specific genetic background somebody goes straight to stay healthy, somebody take the wrong turn and develop disease. And, and the modeling will require big metadata, big data that needs to be then put in a, this, you know, deep machine learning algorithms so that you can come up with some prediction. And that's the future. I believe that, you know, um, it, it, think about this, you know, 10 years ago, if you have to book a flight, you have to go to a travel agency and, and, and book the flight there. <clears throat> now, this is the travel agency. You just book your flight in five minutes. This is going to be the future of healthcare. You know, you book your appointments, you look at your lab, uh, and then, uh, you know, with all the, your genome information, and you know, microbiome analysis that you do on a regular basis, like we do now, checking the glucose level once in a while, you will know in real time through your apps what you need to do in order to stay healthy. That's the way that I see the future coming. Yeah, and that, that makes me think of two pieces in the book that are, are two of my favorite pieces, which are uh, the, the timeline of the microbiome at, at the back, which takes you through the 1680s and Antony von Leeuwenhoek and his microbes, and then all the way up to current time. That's a beautiful piece to kind of give you an overview of that. And also, Alessio's written a, a projection into the future about a future patient and what personalized medicine will mean for the, the, the example he chose was a child on the autism spectrum disorder and a sibling that will be born that might not have that same um, trajectory. So that's that's an interesting interesting piece as well. And on the on the piece of personalized medicine, um, the, the research is just getting to be very exciting. Alessio might speak more about this, but we have a colleague here at MGH, Dr. Andrew Chan, who's come out with a, a study on the Mediterranean diet and and another deep dive into the microbiome and how the Mediterranean diet can be an effective intervention, not just a lifestyle, but an intervention in reducing inflammation, which is, that's kind of turning a corner, would you say, Alessio? Yeah, and then I was, uh, while you were talking about that, I was locals looking at, uh, you know, another couple of questions that uh, Joanne 
place. Uh, for example, say the paleo diet is very popular right now. What is affected us? This kind of diet have on microbiome. Again, there is a huge difference between, you know, diets like paleo, vegetarian, or you know, um, you know, salvage diet, and so on and so forth. That's lifestyle. The Mediterranean diet is truly a therapeutic intervention. If you allow me, you know, the the comparison, you know, again, I know that we're in the midst of, you know. Diversity is good for us because you know culturally you grow when we're diverse, and sometimes we're not being accepting you know cultural, sexual, you know racial, uh, social diversity uh, as a given, but it needs to be fought and negotiated all the all the time. The microbiome doesn't do that. That's come natural. That's what the microbiome wants to be, wants to be diversified, and uh, you know if you give me another you know, chance in another comparison, imagine the microbiome like a farm in which there are different animals. You have the chickens, you have the pigs, you have the horses, you have the cows and so on and so forth. They need to eat different things. And otherwise you don't have a balanced farm. Um, the Mediterranean diet is capable to feed them all and feed them right because it's very much in tune with the gutter hunters kind of lifestyle and diet rich in fruits and vegetables. Why? Because there are a lot of them that you just pick. Very rare meat. Why? Because you have to catch them. And it's lean meat and, and, and tubers, nuts, olive oil, and so on and so forth. That's the way that we evolved for millions of years. And, and you know, when we domesticate foods and then we did massive production of food, this is something that happened in the very last second of this evolution. And, and, and you know, we are paying a dear price about this. Uh, the Mediterranean diet, again, is in line with the way that we used to eat. Uh, so um, that's, that's the reason why it's much more than lifestyle. Yes, and there's also interesting research on the Mediterranean diet and Alzheimer's, uh, another study that came out in August in neurology last year that had 500, over 500 people, and they, they did a controlled study on the Mediterranean diet and factors in brain inflammation. So we haven't talked much about the brain. Maybe unless you could talk a little bit about the brain and, and the microbiome, because there's quite a bit of, we, we address that in the book at length with some of the experts in the field. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, uh, uh, the, that the gut to the brain, they talk with each other was known for a long time, but we were under the impression it was a one-way discussion the brain talk with the gut. You got nervous and anxious and you're gonna get stomachache or diarrhea. Um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome has been always considered the consequence of a, of a stress, you know, signal that comes from the brain to the gut. What we didn't know, and again, with the microbiome studies it became more and more appeared that the gut can talk with the brain. So in other words, it, it, it imbalance, you know, microbiome or dysbiosis may eventually lead to the production of substances that can impinge on the brain functions and the nervous system in general, both the central nervous system, and the peripheral nervous system that again, on a specific genetic background can really create the syndicate to develop conditions like uh, Alzheimer uh, or, you know, uh, autism and so on and so forth. So this is a it's a very fascinating uh, aspect of the microbiome and the gut brain axis that uh, is scored in the book. Yeah. Um, sorry, Kate, I didn't mean to hop in there on the, the uh, moderator, but I th think one question that comes up over and over I saw is uh, about the probiotics and over the counter probiotics and, and what we'll, we'll throw this one to Dr. Fasano because he's the. He's the guy with the MD, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, in the third part of the book, we spend a fair amount of time to discuss, you know, how you manipulate your microbiome and your, your advantage. Uh, of course, probiotics is a way to do that. One of the way to do that, you know, beside the diet and prebiotics and symbiotics and so on and so forth. What is the caveat here? That, you know, again, we don't know how the microbiome works. We just start to think about it. Uh, and, 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 and again, uh, having the presumptuous approach that you will intervene with a given probiotics 
that will eventually make you better or put you know peace in this this biotic situation it's it's really a leap of faith we're not quite there yet you know as i mentioned before there is a very personalized symbiotic relationship between us and this ecosystem that lives with us how you can pretend that a single bullet uh, you know will magically solve the problem for all of us it, it really needs to be personalized. So I'm not saying that probiotics would not have the potential to help rebalance the microbiome, but you know, again, we need to know what's wrong first and why you know, this materialized in the disease in order to eventually intervene, laser pointing to what is the dysbiosis that fix it. So uh, I, this is my very personal opinion. Um, I would not take uh, face value of the probiotics you find over the counter also because they've not been regulated by the FDA. So if they are sold as, you know, um, uh, you know, improving health or food additives, they don't go through the scrutiny of clinical trials that the typical drugs they go for. So any claim that, you know, say this can treat, ameliorate or prevent the disease is not substantiated by strong science. That's what we need, you know, that strong science. I believe in the now, the foundation uh, to do that kind of science is there. Now, just then we have to find the willingness and, and the time to really to move from crawling to walking and running. We're still crawling. Um, if we want to run and to make use of probiotics, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, and uh, that, that leads me back to a piece that in, in the book, chapter three, which Alessio mentioned before is the, uh, that was one of the, the, chapter three was a real bear. That took a lot of work and it was, I don't know why, but you know, but it's, it's kind of an amazing chapter that talks about the early engraftment. So even before the maternal microbiome and what happens there and uh, the, which is kind of fundamental to creating your own personalized microbiome as you're born and you move through the first, basically three years of life that becomes established. So those early factors are, are really critical to that healthy development of the microbiome. And you have um, breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. You have antibiotics, um, which are often used a lot, especially for the preemies and the, the, the children with, with um, problems, which is appropriate, but also well, a problem can be problematic. Um, and so that, that that's a really chapter and we, en we entered into a, a brief scientific debate in that chapter about the sterile womb and with two of the top guys it's it was a lot of fun back and forth to get their different opinions on that and it's still under debate whether our is the womb a sterile environment are there microorganisms in the in the womb that come across the placenta does is it only at birth that we see this um, invasion basically of the microorganisms and the baby starts to develop their own microbiome. So that uh, you might find interesting if you like scientific debate in that piece of the story. So, but then, then we move along as, um, as, as our microbiomes progress, pro sorry, progress. The, the book is really kind of the past. The first section is the past about what we did know and what we are learning about the microbiome. The middle part is about diseases and you know, can almost see it as a present snapshot. And then the third is the future. And the last chapter is on old age and the microbiome. And Alessio, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So again, um, that, that has to do with, again, aging and how this may eventually uh, be manipulated to, you know, live longer lives, but to, you know, with that, uh, you know, oxygen uh, tube in your nose and, and on a wheelchair is not a way to do it. You know, we want to live longer and healthier lives. And again, studying the microbiome can help us to achieve that goal. I've seen a couple of very interesting, uh, uh, Kate, I'm, I'm, we are still in your business here, sorry about that, um, on uh, fasting. Well, one question uh, from Frederick is, what is the relation between fasting and the gut microbiome? And, and, you know, we have another from Anonymous to say, does intermittent fasting do anything for microbiome? What is it about the religious, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, impact uh, a practice like Ramadan? Well, you know, there is a lot of wisdom in the religious world and people, they do stuff 
that they knew it was good for them and, and turned to be correct. And now, again, when it comes to the microbiome fasting, intermittent fasting uh, or fasting not for a long period of time, it's like to push a reset button if something goes wrong there. And, and again, um, you know, um, I remember when I was a kid, my grandma once, uh, twice a year, actually gave us some, you know, uh, remedy to have a flush out of the guts. So you have to have uh, this purging, you know, reset button. It's all same with uh, the, uh, uh, the the intermittent, you know, fasting with related to religion. So there is definitely um, some, you know, merit there. But of course, we are in a learning big, deep, deep learning curve uh, still. Um, okay, what else we need to cover here? Um, uh, well, what about the idea that your first experience of some emotions through your gut, which is this, uh, the fact sends the signal, pay attention to the brain, expressed in vernacular terms as gut feelings. Yeah, <laughs> Kelly made that kind of question. Is indeed, uh, you know, one reason why I have to say our, our editors came up with this idea of the title. This is it. This is really the essence of it. I mean, you know, again, we tend to, you know, dissect the little pieces here and there. When you, you know, when you talk about the car, you know, it, it, you, it's it's a it's a, a global concept. But the car is made by tires, by wires, by computers, by steer wheels, by shield. Each piece is extremely important. Now you can dissect the way that you want it. But it, when everything harmonized, it worked the right way, you turn on and you're on ignition back and poof, everything comes to life. But everything needs to work the proper way in order to really achieve the goal of what you're, you're trying to do. So it never was to, um, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, better life. Um, there are a few other questions now they are pouring in. I don't know. Um, um, uh, so Kelly was also talking about, you know, anxiety, panic attack. Of course, all this, you know, it's, it's, it's been really linked partially, you know, of course, not all, but, you know, the, the microphone would, would not always put the, 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 the ratio, the bar to develop anxiety or panic attack, uh, you know, it, it become much more frequent because these are stuff that happened to all of us. Now, because we have one minute, we, I think that we should leave Kate the prerogative to choose the last question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> definitely... You guys asked all the ones I was thinking of, which was great. Um, the one thing I have seen a few of is people are hoping for maybe additional resources, like where they can see your slides if those are available, where they can learn more about the Mediterranean diet, um, any resources you might recommend besides obviously the book, which I have shared in the chat. <laughs> That's right. So um, there, there is a well, let's start about, you know, the slides and so on and so forth. Uh, I believe that this has been recorded. I don't know if the other bookstore in general put this online. So you can just stop at the slide that you are interested in and take a look at that. No problem there. Um, in terms of resources for the Mediterranean diet, there, there are books and books and books. But if you want to take, uh, you know, a, a one stop and got everything that we discussed today, Again, gut feelings the way to go because there is a session uh, on on a Mediterranean diet and how this really impinge on the microbiome. Uh, you know, I want also to make you know very clear that uh, you know the, the the revenues of this book they go to research. And Susie and I we're not going to make a dime out of this, um, but you know whatever you know will be the revenue of the book we will reinvest immediately to learn more about the microbiome to help, in other words, people to live uh, better, longer lives. Um, just an, as an FYI. So um, if you're now being intrigued by what you heard that you want to learn a little bit more about this, uh, I got feelings that it's something that definitely will help you in that sense. Amazing. Yeah, we have a few. I'm seeing more questions. Do we post the talks online? Yes, we do. Um, I have posted the link in the Zoom chat. It's on our YouTube channel. We have a science book talk series. Um, thank you both so much. I see that we're, we're at time, so I can wrap things up briefly. Um, thank you both of you for this fascinating presentation and thank you everyone for joining us in the middle of your day.
Um, if you would like to learn more, as I've said, copies of Gut Feelings are for sale on harvard.com and the link is in the chat. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, have a great day, everyone. Keep reading and please be well. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe.